The longest unsolved missing child's case in history, Madri West has been missing since 1938. At the time she was four years old, it was Mother's Day and her family had gone to church, after which they went to an area near a forest for a picnic. Her and her older sister Dorothea went to pick flowers for their mother. Their father went trout fishing and her mother went for a rest in the car. Dorothea walked away momentarily, looked back and never saw Marjorie again. Her family desperately searched the area at the time, but after not finding her, they went seven miles to the nearest phone to call the police. 3,000 locals and 500 police turned out to search for Marjorie. There was a $2,500 reward. These searches were difficult due to the fact that the undergrowth was so thick and wild. There were lots of rattlesnakes, which people People ended up killing in vast amounts. Others voluntarily flew their private planes across the area in hopes of detecting her. Police dogs were used and they followed her scent to a clearing by a road. She was very distinctive looking. She had red curly hair and bright blue eyes. There were many theories as to what could have happened to her. Initially, people thought maybe she'd fallen down a well. There were lots of oil wells around this area at the time and they'd been abandoned. The other theory was that she was kidnapped. Now, this was the time of the Great Depression and lots of children and babies were kidnapped or stolen and sold on to richer families. It was reported at the time that certain children's homes made over one million pounds in this industry. They would acquire children illegally. They would steal newborns out of hospitals whilst pretending to be social workers. They would just take poorer children off the streets. They could walk into daycares and pretend they were someone official and just take children from there. They specifically looked for blonde haired blue eyed children as they were the most desirable. A famous example of this is actually Joan Crawford's daughter. So Joan Crawford got her daughter from one of these agencies and later on her daughter did some digging and found out that she was stolen from her birth mother. A year after her disappearance in 1939 we get the beginning of World War II. So the efforts to try and find Marjorie dwindled. Her mum and dad broke up in 1953 and unfortunately her father died in 1965, never knowing what happened to his little girl. At the time, Marjorie's father was out searching constantly and by constantly I mean 24 hours a day to the point where people had to force him to go home to rest and I read somewhere that he rested for like 30 minutes and went back out there again. Her mother, on the other hand, took a different approach and stayed home in the hopes that someone might call or that she might make her way back. There was another theory in the fact that at the time, a man in a Plymouth sedan was seen speeding down the road to the point where he forced a motorcyclist into a ditch. They think maybe he took Marjorie, but his identity has never been discovered. Now, this was an era where children were allowed to roam, play, get muddy, and after this incident, this town became much more stricter on the whereabouts of their children, who were they talking to. It really shifted cultural perceptions on the safety of children. If we fast forward to the year 2000, a man by the name of Beck takes a real interest in this case and he is contacted by a woman in Florida who says that her co-worker is the spit of Marjorie. Obviously now she's a lot older, she has red hair, she has blue eyes. This woman is called Sylvia London and initially she denies any any association with Marjorie at all. After a few years of back and forth between Sylvia and Beck, she finally discloses this information on the condition that it is not released until she dies. She discloses to Beck that on her mother's deathbed, she tells Sylvia that her father stole her in 1938. He was driving down the road when he hit a small girl, Sylvia, and couldn't see anyone around, so he panicked, put her in the car and his plan was to take her to the hospital. However, after driving for a little while, this little girl woke up. She was just unconscious and then she woke up and she was completely fine. Then he was in a conundrum as to what to do. Earlier in that year, him and his wife had suffered a miscarriage. His wife was told that she could no longer have children. He had now got this girl in the back of his car and decided to take her home. It was Mother's Day and he thought, what 
better present to give his wife than a daughter that they could never have themselves. Sylvia says that when she was younger, she would often say to her parents that she remembers a different family and the name Dorothea and Alan really sort of rang a bell and kept coming into her mind. Now these were the names of Marjorie's older siblings. Unfortunately, Dorothea never got to meet Sylvia London as she died before Sylvia's story was told. And some people question Beck's story. The father says when he ran over the girl that there was nobody in the area, but there was. Her whole family were there. A lot of Sylvia's story seems to be taken from newspaper information and newspaper articles. Was she just making this up? It's now really difficult because the condition was that it was only allowed to come out once she died. The problem with this now is that nothing can be corroborated and therefore the validity of this theory is questioned. That's the story of Marjorie West. If you like my content, please remember to like, subscribe and comment and I'll see you in the next one.